Since starting up the God Awful Movies podcast, I've watched a sci-fi reimagining of Jesus with a $9 budget. I've watched two films about the fact that God hates divorce more than he hates emotional abuse, and I'm currently working my way through a full-blown Kirk Cameron trilogy. As you can imagine, I've been in serious need of a good movie lately. So in a sense, my next guest has been something of a there is no God send. Chris Johnson's movie, A Better Life, seeks to fight back against the common theistic charge that failing to attribute life to an imaginary sorcerer somehow sucks the joy and meaning out of it. And he does so with the help of some of the most articulate and respected voices in the atheist movement. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So you touch on this a bit in the movie, but can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to get this whole project started? Well, basically, um, I was a big fan of the New Atheist Movement, and I thought it was fantastic. When I was going to college, all those, all those books came out around that time. You know, God Delusion, God is Not Great, End of Faith, Letter to a Christian Nation, all of those. And I thought they were really wonderful. But as I grew older, I came to the realization that we were missing one large piece of the puzzle in the atheist community. And that was all these books were talking about what we don't believe. And I felt somebody needed to talk about what we do believe. Right on, right on. So uh, now you, you had this idea. So how were you going to set about doing that? How were you going to set about uh, adding that to the conversation? Well, it was tricky because at the time I wasn't really even part of the movement. I was an atheist. I'd always been an atheist, but uh, I wasn't involved in any way. But I had this idea. I wanted to do this book, uh, and then that turned into the film. But I was just a struggling artist living in New York, right? So I didn't have um, I didn't have the means to do it, and so. Uh, that's when I found Kickstarter. I did a, a Kickstarter. Uh, it was a two-month-long fundraising process. Um, it turned out to be the second highest-grossing publishing project that Kickstarter had ever done at the time. Wow. But for all for an atheist book, which I think is pretty cool. And I think it does speak to the necessity for a project like this, that people really felt, oh, this is something new and different and exciting and something we, you know, a perspective we haven't heard before, and that that's important. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. So now you said you were outside of the movement. So how confident were you that these atheists were going to talk to you for the purposes of the book? Um, I wasn't. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, me just sending cold emails saying, mm -hmm. hey, I have this idea. I want to do this project. And I think it speaks to, again, that this was something that was needed, that some of the really big names in the movement uh, agreed with me and thought, wow, this is something new. This is something different and a needed voice in the community. So, you know, they, they climbed on board and it was it was great to have them involved. Right on. Now, was the movie something that was already in your mind as you were setting up the book or did it emerge from that process? It kind of emerged from the process, although I think it was in the back of my mind the whole time. Uh, mm -hmm. I studied film production in college. It was my major. Um, so I had this kind of film filmmaker's uh, brain. And so when I did the interviews for the book, I filmed them. So at the end of the process of putting the book together, not only did I have the book, but I had, you know, 70, 80 hours of interview footage that I could then put together into uh, into the film. So it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of both. Right on, right on. Now, you know, I, I, I'm sure that there were a lot of challenges that arose when you're trying to change this concept from a book uh, to a documentary. So can you speak to some of those challenges? I think one of the biggest challenges for turning the book into the film was there are a hundred people in the book, right? Mm. And so you can't have a hundred people in a documentary film. Right. Uh, it would just be, you know, 15 hours long and nobody would watch it. Um, so the, you know, the I, I'm just saying, I think I would watch 15 hours of the interviews you had, but yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> as, as a pr for practical purposes, it'd be a little, little much. Right. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it was hard, you know, deciding what, what clips to put in, what clips uh, not to put in. And there's a lot of really great footage that just unfortunately due to time constraints uh, just didn't make it into the film. But I am really proud of the finished product in that I really think it is the, the, the best material that I had uh, to work with. But it, it, there is so much that I wanted to include that just didn't make it in for, for time constraints. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it, when you transform this into a, into a film, it demands a lot more in the way of narrative. And it really did seem to have a bit of a narrative as it went through. Now, is that something that you had in mind right away? Or again, is that just something that emerged from the interviews? It, it emerged from the interviews, but I think also it was something that I had in mind. Um, I, uh, so uh, I had kind of a basic structure and idea, um, but some of the details of how everything was going to be woven together 
just emerged as the film was edited together. Mm -hmm. And it just wouldn't be an interview or, uh, or an interview with a New Yorker if there wasn't a siren in the background at some point. Um, I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no, I'm sure. I'm sure you got quite a bit of that when you were doing your interviews as well. So. Um, yes. Now, another one of the big challenges that struck me, you know, and I'm sure it struck you early and often, is how do you keep a, a film visually interesting that's primarily going to be made up of talking heads? But wa after watching the movie, I, I have to tell you, I thought it was visually stunning, and, and not just the parts with Cara Santa Maria on them. Um, so can you tell me, you know, like how you approach that challenge? That was uh, actually a, a big challenge of the film, and I really wanted it to be beautiful. And that, that was actually one of the, the major goals of it was both the book and the film as well is to create something in the atheist community that is really beautiful and gorgeous because most of the, the materials that we have, most of the really good materials are intellectual. They're written, right? You know, the arguments they're, they're, they're written down. And so uh, this is again, something I think that was really needed. Um, but you're right. It is a challenge in a talking head interview to make it visually interesting um, and so I, I appreciate that you found it uh, visually beautiful to watch because I really tried to insert those moments, insert those shots and weave that story together, including those moments that were were really visual. So it wasn't just Talking Head, even though the film is primarily Talking Head. Mm -hmm. um, I think having those moments uh, where you see different places around the world um, and you connect these intellectual arguments to the real world and to our history and to our geography, um, I think makes the film a lot more um, dynamic than it would be if it were just all talking head. Well, and it's also so pivotal considering the subject of the film, because you can't say, you know, atheists see all the beauty in the world and then present a, a film that's not beautiful. So uh, I, I was really impressed with that. And I, and I could tell I was going to like this movie a lot right away because it opens with this beautiful rendition of Amazing Grace with the with the lyrics written down on screen and as the song's being sung the camera is zooming in on the word wretch mm -hmm. now i i think the point here is obvious but if you don't mind spell it out for us a little and tell us why you felt that that was the right message to open the film with well i wanted to start with something uh, that would really captivate the audience and i felt um amazing grace is first of all a song that everybody knows right if you're religious or if you're not religious you know the song amazing grace at least the first uh, 12 words yes Right, right. There's a lot that people don't know, I'm sure, but at least the beginning people know. And uh, so religious people, I think, knowing the film, uh, or sorry, knowing, knowing the hymn, you know, I'm starting from a place that they are familiar with, mm -hmm. right? And for atheists, I think they're a little surprised, kind of catches them off guard. What? This movie's starting with a hymn? Right. Uh, so kind of like the best of both worlds there, I think. But I wanted to, to emphasize the fact that here's this thing that many people think is one of the most beautiful songs in the English language. And yet what it's actually saying um, isn't necessarily the greatest thing. Right. So by focusing in on that word wretch, I think it, it shows that, you know, wow, there, a wretch like me saved a wretch like me. What, what is this? What is this saying? So I think it's a good kind of place to, to jump off from uh, for a film like this for mm -hmm. religious and non-religious people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it really grabbed a hold of me right away. Um, now, you've already mentioned this a little bit, but I, I want to kind of circle back to it because towards the beginning of the film, during the voiceover, you talk about how, uh, you know, you talk about some of the vitriol against atheism and a lot of the focus on the movement on disproving religion, explaining the flaws in, in theistic uh, thinking, etc. And then you say mm -hmm. you want to help change the conversation. Like I said, you've already touched on this a bit, but two part question. Number one, what's wrong with the camp conversation as it now stands? And number two, what changes are you trying to make? Well, I think the conversations that we're having now are really good, um, and I think they're needed. Um, so it's not that I want to replace the current conversation with simply talking about what we do believe. Um, I think the arguments of the New Atheist Movement, I think the arguments against the existence of, the existence of God, you know, showing why uh, religion can be uh, you know, a force that is that is doing harm, great harm, serious harm in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are really important points to make, and I'm I'm really glad that people are making them. Uh, what I want to do is I just want to add to that, and I want to say, in addition to that, I think we also need to talk about this. We need to talk about, you know, what happens when you when you lose your faith. What happens when there is no God? How does that change your life? How does that change how you see the world and everybody around you? Uh, because I think that's a piece of the puzzle uh, that 
that is missing and that is important. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a constant challenge for the atheist movement because we are united by what we don't believe. So presenting a positive message is, is rather difficult, but it is necessary because so many people seem to th at least think they take so much positive stuff out of religion, they want to replace it when it's gone. And I guess that leads me right into my next question. Who exactly is this movie for? Who did you have in mind? Well, not to be uh, full of myself, but I, I actually, I want it, I want the film to be for everyone. I want the film to be, I don't want to just, for lack of a better phrase, preach to the choir. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do, uh, you know, I, I do want religious people to see it. I want everybody to see it if, if possible. You know, I think that if, if atheists watch the film and they have all around the world and get something out of it, that's, that's really amazing. And, and the reaction I've gotten uh, so far has been wonderful. Um, but also, you know, religious people can watch it and maybe change their perception of what atheists are like, that's doing some good work as well. So hopefully it can, it can work for everyone and they can get something out of it. Right on, right on, awesome. Uh, now, and, and I think, you know, it, it, it bothered me a lot as I was uh, watching this, thinking to myself, there are so many religious people who would refuse to watch this or would watch the, or would turn it off as soon as they realized what it was, when this is a message that would be so impactful to, to not only like to just the liberal people or the, the religious people who are maybe wavering in their faith, but I think even to the fundamentalists to just see that, you know, the atheists are humans as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually don't know how offended many religious people would be by the film because it's not necessarily a combative film. Right. It's not a film that's saying, oh, look how stupid you are. You're an idiot for believing this. You know, oh, this is silly. Um, it, it's really not. And so I think religious people often are a little confused about how to respond to a film like this because it's not attacking them in the same way that they're used to being attacked you know what i mean right right no yeah it, it, it definitely would would uh, catch them off guard quite a bit i just know that so many people as soon as they got the sense that anything in this movie was going to challenge their faith that would be enough for them mm -hmm. now i apologize if this question is kind of like asking you to pick a favorite kid but <laughs> if you could add any one person to your list of interviews somebody that you weren't able to get in touch with or somebody that uh, wasn't able to do it uh, who would have been in the movie that wasn't or in the book that's a really tough question it is like you know having to pick your favorite kid. Uh, <laughs> Feel free to give more than one answer. Uh, if it's a... There, there are, you know, uh, there are many people that I think would have been great. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get Christopher Hitchens before he passed away right. for the book though. I did get uh, his, his wife. So his wife is in the film. Uh, sorry, his wife is in the book. And I, I think actually having her there uh, is very poignant just the way that that's done in the book is really interesting, but uh, it would have been great to have got to him before, before he died. So I, I feel a little bad that, that I wasn't able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure, uh, especially later in his life, he would have had such poignant things to say that would have been so appropriate uh, for the film. And I think it also would, would be different than people I think would think of him as, you know, because one of the things I'm trying to do with the film is, is change is, is uh, you know, uh, combat those stereotypes that people have about atheists. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think having someone like him in there talking about more beautiful things, would, I think would surprise some people, you know, right. because they're so used to hearing him talk about uh, religion in, in, a, in a stronger way. So I think that would have been a really interesting contrast between the work that he's known for and, you know, something like this. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely like. There were a few people in in the uh, film, like you know Matt Dillahunty, you know the kind of people whose whose edges could definitely be softened in the public eye, and I think that's a that's a, a really valuable thing to do, uh, because if you talk to the guy at, at all, he's a great guy with a great sense of humor, but his public persona mm -hmm. often comes off because you always see him in debates, etc., as this very um, uh, confrontational guy, uh, perhaps a reputation undeserved. Mm -hmm. um, so now, ultimately, both the book and the movie were about your personal journey, a, a journey of discovery for you. So I, I have to ask, what did you learn along the way? Is there anything that you didn't expect to find out or any answers that you were just, that really like blew your hair back? I was surprised at how it did affect me. I think for a while you think of you know, intellectual conversations and intellectual arguments as just kind of being on their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I was surprised how it did affect me. Um, one of the things in the film, for example, towards the end, uh, Julia Sweeney talks about, you know, reflecting on the happiest moments in your life. 
mm-hmm. and really, really dwelling on those. And I find myself actually doing that more and more, uh, especially when I'm in moments where I'm really, really happy. I will think to myself, "Ooh, let me, let me just savor this moment for a minute, and and stick this in my brain somewhere so I can remember it and and recall it later." Because, like she says in the film, this is all you have at the end of the day. These memories are are all you have. So uh, that's really affected me in a, in a very profound way, and I'm I'm thrilled that that she had that impact on me. I gotta say, you know, there were a lot of very impressive interviews, but there were a couple of moments you had with Julia Sweeney that just gave me goosebumps. You know, when she talked about the way that people use religion to. Um, allow themselves to think, oh, I'm a good person and that's what matters. It's, it's not about what I've done. It's not what about, about what I'm doing now. It's about the deep inside, I love Jesus and I think good thoughts. I thought that mm-hmm. might have been the single most impactful moment uh, in the film for me as far as the interviews went. Thank you for saying that. I, I, that moment in particular also is one of my favorites. I, I think that's it's such a unique perspective that I don't, again, I don't think we hear that much. I don't think we hear people saying that. And so to have that in there, I think is really, really powerful. And especially coming from somebody so, who's so approachable, who we all know from when we were watching Saturday Night Live as kids and everything. It was a really, really great moment. Uh, but I, I want to actually uh, talk very briefly about my favorite moment in the movie, because th- there were a lot of times throughout this thing where I'm thinking to myself, you know, man, Tracy Harris is a genius, or ah, that's Sean Carroll. I could listen to him talk all day, or, you know, A.C. Grayling, that's one sharp cookie. But mm-hmm. it wasn't until the end of the movie you have this little montage of all the different atheists that you've been talking to, just out kind of enjoying their lives, you know, playing musical instruments, playing with the dogs, standing in awe of the natural world. That was the first moment where I thought to myself, hey, you know what, this, this Chris Johnson guy, he's a pretty sharp cookie, too. That was a very inspired close for the film. Thank you. Really impressed by that. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I found myself often getting jealous through the movie, thinking, man, I wish I could, you know, sit with all of these awesome people and talk about atheism. And then it occurs to me, well, I can, and that's what this movie is. So, uh, so thanks for sharing. Thank you. I really appreciate it a lot. And, of course, if you'd like to see the movie or pick up a copy of the book, you can do so at theatheistbook.com. Phenomenal URL, by the way. Uh, you can also find links on the show notes to this episode at scathingatheist.com. And uh, there are also several screenings coming up around the country, correct? Yeah, around the country and around the world. Oh, right on, right on. And uh, I saw you had a page for that on theatheistbook.com. We'll have that linked as well. Uh, I believe the next one is going to be at Apostacon this coming weekend, correct? That's right. Awesome. All right. Well, you know, my opinion on movies isn't worth much anymore since all it takes for me to enjoy a movie at this point is a lack of Kirk Cameron or Ray Comfort. But for what it's worth, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.